Welcome to the San Mateo Arboretum Society's monthly Zoom seminar, Wildlife Habitat in Your Backyard with Mike Acevedo. It will last approximately 60 minutes and be recorded. Following the presentation will be a question and answer session. Submit questions during the presentation by clicking the chat box icon. A few days after the presentation, you will be emailed a link to the recording and to an evaluation form to provide feedback. Before we start, a little information about what is happening at the Arboretum Society. Our nursery in San Mateo Central Park is open Saturdays and Sundays, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Enter the North Gate and wear a mask. Payment is by credit or debit card and Apple or Google Pay. No cash is accepted. While you're in Central Park, Today's presenter is Mike Acevedo. He is the uh, County Coordinator and Naturalist for the California Bluebird Recovery Program in the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society and has been an advocate for habitat gardening as a way to save our vanishing wildlife. Welcome, Mike. Hello, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, what I'd like to do now is to have, uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in chat and I'll talk, tackle them at the end. Um, throughout the presentation, you'll hear about native plant gardens around Central California and want to know, uh, you might want to know how to visit them or where to find more information uh, about the things that I talk about, et cetera. Um, I'll be providing a resources page with links, locations, and other information I talk about within a few days, hopefully sooner. I have a little hereditary problem uh, I got from my dad. I can't give short answers. So it is definitely best to try and get through the talk first. Um, before I start, a quick bit about my organization, the California Bluebird Recovery Program. We've been around since the 90s, created by Don Yoder. I'm a county coordinator for Santa Clara County. I also work closely with the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society in a dual role. Anything I do with the, within the county, basically I do for both organizations. Now, as you can imagine, that job has to do with helping people understand how to have success with nest, with nest boxes for bluebirds, tree swallows, and a host of other cavity nesting songbirds, as well as installing boxes for barn owls, wood ducks, American kestrels, northern flickers, burrowing owls, bats, bumblebees, and even the occasional native deer mouse or wood rat. But, um, and I've been a county coordinator now for 13 years. And uh, as my experiences have grown, I've tried to branch out and make a bigger difference in the world. I met Georgette Howington, another county coordinator for, for Contra Costa County and Alameda County in 2013 at a national bluebird conference. And since then we've discovered that each rec we each recognize the tragic destruction the humans are causing to our environment. We have been teaming up to try and do something about that. One of our actions has been to start a Facebook page for the California Bluebird Recovery Program. And we haven't just been sticking to sharing photos of bluebirds. We've also been using it to show people what works and what we've been doing wrong when it comes to uh, wildlife habitat. Now, let me quickly digress and tell you that I've been a, a fan of wildlife habitat for a long time. And when I watch habitat destruction, it really troubles me because I was always given the very real and accurate concept that once you destroy habitat, restoring it will never do justice to what you had before. And it is true that if you take down even a single tree, the amount of life or that you are denying a home as a home for animals is incredible. 70% of our native bees, for example, nest underground. So the scraping you see of all the soil and preparation for development is an obliteration of a lot of life. You can't see and have no idea is being destroyed. But the feudal attitude that nothing at all can be done is absolutely not warranted. So much can be done to provide homes for wildlife in an urban setting, and it is aggravating to realize that our current, <coughs> our current society is set up to destroy habitat and not even try to replace it. So let me uh, ask you something. What is the difference between the coastal prairie of Andy Nuevo and the landscaping of restaurants, shops, shopping centers, and even houses nearby? It's the plants. 
the native bees and the other pollinators supported by native coastal prairie is incredible. And the crepe myrtles and the ginkgos and plants from overseas that we use to landscape are often not visited by, uh, by our pollinators. So when was the last time you drove over the scrub covered hills and thought to yourself, what we really need here are more plants from Africa or Australia? Because effectively that's what we tend to do. We rip out the plants that our pollinators depend on and plant foreign vegetation. But the truth is we don't need to resort to weird plants from far away. Today, we're gonna to see that native plants are beautiful and what we're doing, what we need to do to help our wildlife bring them back is plant native plants. So we set up this Facebook page and I began watching for articles on how we could help. And I kept seeing references that we should be planting native plants. It sounded good. So I made sure that we included posts on our Facebook page. Then I saw this video that hit me like a brick. It put an exclamation point on the need for native plants. Now, by now I have to assume, and I certainly hope that at least some of you have heard the name Doug Ptolemy. And there is no way I could do justice to the information that I received from his talk or his books. But you can watch this video, Restoring Nature's Relationships on YouTube, and I beg you to do just that. Now, this is a talk that he gave back in February of 2018 to the Los Angeles chapter of the California Native Plant Society. He is actually very active, giving many talks, a lot of which are recorded and available. He's been in California many times. I've met him a couple of times. He has three books out currently. I'll talk more about that at the end. I just wanna give you a quick synopsis of his message. But again, I highly encourage you to watch the presentation on YouTube. So the first concept to know is that 95% of all, all birds feed insects to their young. This includes seed eating birds, hummingbirds. And frankly, if it is a small bird, don't bother asking, the answer is yes. And it makes sense, right? Because Young, the young have to grow from the size of an egg to the size of an adult in two weeks or so. You don't do that without protein. Of the insects that they feed to their young, caterpillars, uh, in other words, the larval form of butterflies and moths, also known as lepidopterans, are a major component. It makes sense because those little packages of protein are easy to feed the to the, the young mouths and with little worry about damage to their sensitive throats. So with birds being so dependent on insects and caterpillars in particular, it is important that we have an environment conducive to caterpillars, uh, but modern landscaping is anything but that. Trees and plants in our yards come from Australia, Africa, Europe, and so on. A look at our nearest nursery, your nearest nursery is likely to present you with only a handful of plants that might have come from anywhere in California. And the fact is most have not a one that has ever been found anywhere near where you live. This is a problem because caterpillars evolved with local native plants. You've seen butterflies get, getting nectar from a host of plants, uh, many of them being non-native. And you might think that that is all that they need, not so. Though adult butterflies and moths can get nectar from a variety of plants, some native, some non-native, the caterpillars tend to specialize on certain native host plants. That is, the caterpillars eat the flesh of the plant. The plants have defenses and each native caterpillar has developed a way around those defenses of certain native plants. As you know, monarch butterflies, such as the caterpillar you see here, are able to eat milkweed which are highly toxic to other butterflies. Other butterflies have a similar relationship with native plants. I love attention, the attention that monarchs get, but every time I see people so concerned for monarchs, I'm always reminded that butterflies in general are in the same uh, boat and don't get any attention at all. Without the plants, each butterfly species depends on as a host. Each butterfly is unable to reproduce. Without the caterpillars, uh, without the, the plants that each butterfly species depends on as host, each butterfly is unable to reproduce. Without the caterpillars that those host plants aren't around, 
to host, though there are no caterpillars, for birds to feed their young. No insects, no birds, it's a vicious cycle. And one of the illustrations that Doug Ptolemy spoke of was a comparison of caterpillars able to host off of native plants compared to non-native plants. He had his students pick a native oak tree and they were able to find hundreds of caterpillars on that tree. Then they moved to a non-native tree. In this case, it was a Calgary pear. Doug Ptolemy is based in, uh, in Delaware. And he found something like four caterpillars over the entire tree. And in repeated caterpillar surveys, they found stark differences between native trees and non-native trees, the, um, demonstrating that native insects could only be found on native trees. The exceptions were few and far between. Uh, most often, non-native trees had no caterpillars at all. Some plants are very good at de delivering pollen, and some, uh, and many native bees, are spe uh, specifically looking for the pollen. I'll be making a big deal about native plants in this presentation, but there are non-native plants that are good sources of pollen. And nectar is another commodity that pollinators are really looking for. And again, there are some non-native plants that do a good job of providing nectar. The Zierse Society still says that many native plants do a better job, but even some scientists who should know, and, and I, I'm actually talking about our friend, uh, Al uh, Art, Art Shapiro, um, uh, uh, professor, um, the, uh, there are some non-native plants that do a better job of providing nectar and pollen. And many pollinator gardens I see concentrate on nectar and pollen, but here is the problem. With few exceptions, a plant that can host the caterpillars of lepto lepidopterans need to be native. Pollen and nectar plants can be non-native, but without native plants, many pollinators are still in trouble. And that is where we start to see exactly what is happening to our insects. If you get your plants from Home Depot, Lowe's, or even many plant nurseries, you will find a plethora of non-native plants. The number of host plants you can find at a nursery is very small. Most nurseries have no plants that are native to the very location that those nurseries are located. So humans have introduced many non-native invasive species that uh, plants that often outcompete native plants so that we don't even have to depopulate native plants to get rid of them. And when we do destroy uh, native plants, we plant non-native plants in their place. We couldn't have a more perfect plant habitat destroying system. And this, and if this was 20 or 30 years ago, there would be little each of us could do about it. We wouldn't have Doug Ptolemy pointing the way. We would have literally nowhere to go for native plants or information on what plants are native to our specific region. But we are decades into an era where we have tools to use to find out what better butterflies live in our neighborhood, what native plants used to live here, what those local butterflies and moths need in the way of host plants. We have native plants available as seeds from local seed companies and plants available from nurseries that aren't that far away. So let's talk about the tool that I hope you are familiar with. It's called Calscape and it is available at calscape.org. Calscape is, is an unbelievable tool that will let you determine what plants were in your neighborhood before the destruction really started. This is important because the native insects in your area have fewer and fewer places to lay their eggs. And in past presentations, I gave a static demonstration of Calscape, but it has dawned on me that I could do a better job by giving an actual demonstration at the end of the talk. I'll give a really brief overview of Calscape right now. But um, so if you open up Calscape and enter your address uh, here in, this, in the little bubble right there, um, <clears throat> hopefully you see that. Um, you will find all the trees, shrubs, perennials, annuals, grasses, vines, and ferns that were once found uh, here and in few, a few cases might still be here, um, uh, here and there. So in general, the, in a general search for San Mateo, I made native trees. This is just literally the top of the page here. Um, 
uh, I found uh, native trees that uh, in for San Mateo. This is the city of San Mateo. You can put in Pacifica, you can put in San Bruno, you can put in South San City. It'll give you slightly different results. Um, native trees included coast live oak, blue elderberry, big leaf maple, valley oak, madrone, creek dogwood, Monterey pine, red willow, holly leaf cherry, leather oak, California blue uh, buckeye, California laurel, red alder, knob cone pine, Monterey cypress, choke cherry, and 13 other willows, oaks, pines, cottonwoods. And they, they showed up as native to this city. These each have insects that depend on them. And an insect looking for their specific host may be hard pressed to find one. So what species of trees are used in your parks in San Mateo? As street trees? The, there are 94 shrubs that followed, um, that showed up on my general San Mateo search. And they include toyon, silverbush lupin, California black uh, coffeeberry, black sage, golden currant, bush monkey flower, huckleberry, coast barberry, hairy ceanothus, common snowberry, Pacific blackberry, which by the way is much more slow going and growing and invasive than the Himalayan blackberry and much more attractive. So the native plants of your area include some gorgeous plants and Calscape will tell you what they are and provide lots of information on them and including how many, how much water they, they need. Uh, and of course, uh, many of them are drought tolerant, but the, where to get them by providing the nurseries where you can find them. It tells you what butterflies and moths host off of each one um, and each native plant and provides maintenance tips. And not only that, it tells you the sun and shade requirements and um, even sorts them in such a way that you can look specifically for shade loving plants native to your yard. Uh, um, all of that is gonna be done demonstrated in a little bit. So Calscape is just one tool. There are others such as Calflora that can also help you. But how do you get native plants? This has been an issue until recently, but the word is getting out. The sources of native plants are out there. Native plant nurseries can be found in the Bay Area. So here are some ideas. And by the way, what, what is this slide? This is the list of nurseries for, that carry coast live oak trees. Calscape tells you where you can find any particular native plant. Around San Mateo County and nearby, there are several native plant nurseries. One thing about native plant nurseries is their hours are not always very convenient to the point that some are actually only open during very restricted hours. And in some cases, it's practically an annual event when they're open. There are some that are further away, like uh, in Berkeley, San Francisco, where they have much broader hours. Annie's Annuals in Richmond has a very wide selection of native plants and is open typical business hours and will ship to you at home, or you can work, uh, so you can look, look on their website, or you can uh, work, um, you can actually have your favorite nursery order from them um, and, and have them delivered to your favorite nursery. Annuals in particular are good to plant by seed. And there are seed companies like Larner Seeds and Bolinas that allow you to order many native seeds from them. You can even find some native, uh, some annual seeds available from Amazon. Um, it may take some searching to find good sources, but they are out there. Now, you might be thinking that Doug Ptolemy wants you to uproot all of your non-native plants and replace them all with native plants. Well, that's not true. What he's looking for is a paradigm shift. First of all, we have to understand that holes in our leaves are a good thing. They indicate that your garden is part of the ecosystem. If you can't see the damage from 10 feet away, what is the problem? And the second part of this shift is that he asked that, <coughs> excuse me, each plant in your garden should have a purpose. Now let's face it, there are plants in your garden that, um, that their only contribution is that you love them. Well, that's fine. Tomatoes give us food, roses give us cut flowers. There's nothing wrong with that, but there is something that really isn't giving you all that much um, and it isn't giving nectar or pollen or hosting a butterfly or a moth or anything like that um, that maybe we can replace. Lawns have their uses too, but 
Do you need quite as much lawn as you have? Could you take part of it <coughs> and convert it to natives, to a butterfly, a hummingbird or native bee garden? So let me uh, talk about a couple of other ideas because many of uh, my ideas have several applications. From taking a spot in your own backyard uh, garden to bringing your community together to do good things for local wildlife in your own backyard, so to speak. I've stripped out many of the general community ideas to try these, I, I had to really strip down this talk, but um, to concentrate on your backyard, but there are some ideas I just really wanted to tell you about. So the late great Pat Patrick Pizzo was a native plant advocate in South San Jose who championed native plants and was able to get volunteers to create native plant islands. These can go by a number of different names, butterfly way stations, pollinator gardens, uh, wildlife corridor habitat gardens, but uh, the purpose of this is to provide habitat. And though big plots and of land with these plants are a wonderful thing and need to be attempted, the important thing here is that even relatively small patches of native plants can make a real difference. So that's one idea, native plant islands. You can do this in your yard. You can try it and encourage such a thing in your neighborhood park. And you can find Patrick's California native plant islands at Jeffrey Fontana Park in South San Jose. This is a cool, easy and compact idea. And the concept is one you can think about for a backyard. The idea is that you create an island of native plants rather than having such a large area that you overexert yourself in trying to take care of it, you can set up a mound that can be easy to take care of. And this is a, a kind of corridor for pollinators. If we have a multiple islands, for example, uh, one in this park and others around the city, the same pollinators can use them in as, <coughs> excuse me, as a set, a set of stepping stones. So they can feed as they move around. I saw this being promoted in Indiana and thought it was cool, the idea of, uh, of uh, native plant gardens. I started looking into it and found that Patrick was doing it right here in San Jose. And this stepping stone idea, it has to be, it is gonna be a big feature in something I wanna be talking about a little bit later on, um, on how we can save endangered butterflies and the idea is coming up. So you saw that Patrick Pizzo did this with a small area of a local city park. Here are a couple of other ideas where volunteers made something out of land that was being wasted with ivy or chip. The story behind the Primrose Way pollinator garden is pretty funny. Juanita Salisbury, who like Patrick Pizzo is the hero of this story, was not happy with an ugly roadside strip of ivy covered land um, in her neighborhood. Remember that ivy is non-native, does not contribute to the ecosystem, but does seem to be a great habitat for roof rats. She decided to do something about that. She removed the ivy and began to plant native and pollinator specialist type plants. And that's when the city came by. You see, she hadn't actually told anybody she was gonna do this. And she start, was just hoping that she could make some changes and no one would notice it. No one would, would know who did it. But it was too late. Rather than getting mad, that like, like she was afraid they would, the city officials just kind of stretched her, their chin and said, hmm, and they moved on. So she kept it up. And the results were so positive that the city came back to her saying that they had other neglected strips that could use her help. She developed a volunteer group and has quite a, a list of pollinator strips going around the city of Palo Alto. And as the demonstration of just how much the city of Palo Alto has bought into this, the photos I'm showing you are hosted on a city of Palo Alto website. I learned of Juanita Salisbury's story from a presentation she gave at Gamble Gardens. Um, and I couldn't find a photo that did justice to the native plant garden in Gamble Gardens. But I, and I think that's in Menlo Park, Palo Alto. I'm not sure which one, um, but, uh, at least I wanted to mention that it's there uh, so that you could go uh, find a, a good place locally to go for uh, native plant inspiration. So Eulistack na Native uh, Natural Area sits on the site of an old golf course. 
After some of the land was developed, the city of Santa Clara had land left over. They have an active volunteer crew that has been actively converting it to a natural chaparral and oak woodland. It is now regularly birded for the Audubon field trips. The nearby Guadalupe River has a nice wide natural area between levees and Eula Stack easily draws birds in from it. The riparian habitat of the river blends really well with the chaparral of the oaks and oaks of Eula Stack. And this is yet another city sponsored or city endorsed native plant project. And you know it had to start somewhere. It also uses the plant community concept that I will talk about more later. This is La Loma Native Garden. Uh, it is a creation of an active group of neighbors in the La Loma neighborhood of Modesto. They have La Loma Park, but the real pride of the fighting of this tight neighborhood community is this native garden. Volunteers turned a roughly one-fifth mile strip of city-owned dirt into a community garden featuring native plants and trees that need little water, a butterfly garden, bird habitat, and a walking path run through it all. That is how the local paper described it. And La Loma's native garden is celebrated with an annual pollinator festival. This year's festival takes place on April 9th. I attended the first annual festival. I have lots of photos in, of the festival itself, including booths from the Boy Scouts, the 4-H, and many other or agencies and organizations. It is truly a point of neighborhood pride. Now, most of the point of the plants in the garden are hosts to local native butterflies and moths. They, and they are proud to illustrate this during the festival with signs talking about which local butterflies can host off of each plant. Some time, uh, some springtime in this garden is unbelievable. The pollinator festival happens just as the blooms are hitting their peak. The garden isn't just for beauty, it's a demonstration garden. How can you see a beautiful garden like this and not decide to plant the favorites that you find there in your own yard? And that means that the local pollinators don't just get to live here, but throughout the neighborhood. The Facebook page shows artists coming in uh, to paint the landscaping. I was taking photos in the garden one day and people I talked to were, um, who were walking by say that they deliberately planned their dog walking and jogging routes so they could go through this beautiful garden. School kids from nearby school are documented on the Facebook page coming in to check uh, out the plants and the wildlife that they attract. If if, if, if I didn't have so many photos that I took myself, I could have populated this page with Facebook photos, including those with the butterflies like the Gulf Fritillary that visit this garden. The, gar the, the garden was started by the community with support from the city of Modesto to improve a neglected strip of land and provide a usable space for the neighborhood. Um, much of the assets in the garden come from donations and neighborhood efforts. Modesto Subaru, a nearby business, donated the money to make this happen. There are various sections of garden. The blue garden hosts uh, blue-eyed grass, Ceanothus, Cleveland sage, and other bluish blooms. The striking dark blooms, blue blooms on the Ceanothus are a must-see and attract large numbers of bees, both native and honeybees, native bees and honeybees. Another developing color area is the yellow garden, which has sunflowers, wallflowers, and other asters. And there is the Cabral Ag Center in Stockton. The UC Master Gardeners created this garden that includes a Cal California native garden as well as other themed gardens. What I love about this garden is that despite the fact that it is fairly far from anything I would call real habitat nearby, the variety of native birds uh, that visit is immense. It really has to be a gold mine for local birds because they come from far away to visit this garden. The birds must be, have to take quite a trip to get to this little oasis. So let's talk about backyards uh, since basically that's how I build the talk. Um, first up is my own backyard. I live in the Central Valley now and my yard is as near as I can figure to unique in terms of a Manteca yard. Now, I wanted to give you a little, insp uh, little inspiration for this habitat gardening. 
now I'm just learning how to do this. I, I have to say that I'm impressed with what is going on in the way of insect life in my yard. You may have heard about the painted lady migration uh, we've had in recent years. I have a bunch of painted lady host plants and I had a lot of painted ladies visit my yard. And here is uh, Clepsis fucana. I've never been so excited to see a drab little moth like this. I think the fact that I've got all these moths hosting off my plants and I can't even tell which plants they're coming from is a testament to the fact that we can have all these insects in our yard without really noticing them. And the tremendous damage some people might think they cause is just, it, it just doesn't, it, it's really overblown. Moths in general need our help. Doug Ptolemy said that he's actually more worried about moths than he is about butterflies. Because perhaps one reason is that butterflies are shiny things compared to moths. Just because butterflies are so beautiful and moths are so drab, but we need to help our moths too. Frankly, I can't believe the number of moths flying around in my garden. There are times when I walk around in my garden and little clouds of moths wake up and fly around. I certainly never noticed them um, until I had a habitat garden. So it really speaks to the idea that if you plant it, they will come. And uh, this is the Western aphid eater. So many of the pollinators in my yard, my garden, uh, a surprising number are flies. And the one, and this one is, I presume also a predator based on the name. Here it is working on a sage and probably one of the several different Cleveland sage hybrids. Um, same species, but this is one's working on uh, baby blue eyes, an annual. Um, the Western aphid eater is a hoverfly. And this little guy right here is also a hoverfly, but is a little different species. The plant is one of the many bush lupins that I have um, of varying colors in my yard. The brown halter bee mimic fly, um, again on baby blue eyes. And uh, I don't know where all this red stuff is coming from. A uh, common uh, drone fly on tidy tips, another annual. So although this is a metallic uh, green sweat bee, I'm still learning my insects and I'm not swearing that this is actually the species name. I've actually got a couple of different kinds of sweat bees in my yard. They're really cute. And with 70% of native bees nesting in the ground, it should be obvious that the amount of lawn, chip and bark, concrete, and the total lack of bare ground is a problem for nesting native bees. My house is approaching four years and already it is only, it's probably the only real open ground in the neighborhood as far as I can tell. This mama sweat bee creating her nesting chambers underground for her eggs with pollen to feed them on. Uh, Valley uh, carpenter bee. Um, earlier when I was talking about pollen, I showed you an all black bee. That was the female valley carpenter bee. This is the male, which is also known as the teddy bear bee. Uh, convergent lady beetle. Um, one thing that seems to be an indication of ecosystem, ecosystem health in my yard is the presence of so many predators. In addition to the lady beetle as a predator, I also have toads, lizards, and various birds running around my yard. The toad always just sits there until you get too close. Then it runs like hell, which is kind of comical for a toad. But I only, I, I only ever never notice him I only notice him when he suddenly panics and runs for cover. The reason that this is interesting is that my house is only four years old and it has nothing, it had nothing but an ag field that it was before. And they went in and they sprayed it all out with pesticides. Believe me, that wasn't my idea. Um, but I'm surrounded by orchards and cornfields and I'm trying to figure out where the toads came from. Um, and another thing that I see a lot of in my yard is another set of predators of flies and dragonflies. The Xerxes Society is discovering that native plants draw in predators, which can work on those insects on your vegetables. So, um, and they're telling farmers to plant hedgerows of native plants, just so the predators can be used to help the produce. This is a way of reducing pesticide use. The sand wasp is a predator and a pollinator. And this digger wasp is also a predator. 
Both of these wasps dig in the ground with the sweat bees. Um, it is to create, um, it was to create the nest, it, it, with the sweat bees, it was to create the nesting chambers with pollen and egg and for reproduction. But I'm, I'm thinking with these two, uh, these other two wasps, I think what they do is they dig and they plant, um, uh, they put uh, the prey down there and then they, uh, they plant their eggs on that. Um, also seen in my yard is a flock of lark sparrows, as well as house finches and western bluebirds. And Sace Phoebe and uh, Black Phoebe are regular visits to my yard. They are um, both flycatchers. This is one of our cars in the driveway. I've got sages and manzanitas and other native plants in my front yard garden as well. But these flycatchers also live in like the backyard. And uh, native plants, I'm gonna see, if, oh, that's what the problem is. It's, uh, I'm trying to figure out what's going on with these, uh, these red marks. Um, so Anna's hummingbird and black uh, chin, the hummingbird are frequent visitors to my house. My yard is a pollinator garden and with hummingbird plants and uh, it's basically a butterfly garden and moth host plants and plants specifically meant for native bees. Um, another yard I'd like to feature is that of Al Kite, a retired professor in Moraga. All last year, Georgette and I ran back and forth to Moraga to document each season's blooms. Al has developed quite a knowledge of the dozens of plants in his yard. We developed six videos uh, where Al um, gave his secrets to year-round beauty, which were shown last year during the Bringing Back the Natives Garden Tour, in which he, frank, he frequently participates. And as the season progresses, um, but different plants come into bloom, beginning with manzanitas and some of the long bloomers before hitting the peak in May, in, uh, May when the garden hits its climax. The story of Al tells is that back in 1972, he had just moved into the house and had a lawn in ivy. It wasn't long before he grew tired of mowing, watering, hedge trimming, edging, and on and on. They were already worried about the drought and saving water. So around the same time, Al uh, and his wife became birders. As they took little um, birding trips around the state, Al was really impressed with the habitats he saw. Specifically, he loved manzanita. So he decided that it would be really nice to have some of that manzanita in his own yard. But why stop there? His yard began to look like the chaparral covered uh, trails of Mount Diablo and other birding hotspots that he loved to visit and the places that he would go fly fishing. Advantages uh, of chaparral backyard uh, gardens have to do with water savings and low maintenance and currently it's unusual and attractive. Chaparral is uh, something of a catch all term because it encompasses a lot of different plants. And Al pointed out that in some of his favorite places, the manzanita is broken up with Yerba Santa and Chamise. So if you look in this plant, in this uh, picture, you have Chamise and Yerba Santa and many other kinds of uh, plants. So um, with the list of chaparral plants seems endless. And the neat thing about working with chaparral yard is that you get to decide the plant mix. Plant, a manzanita is a favorite of Al's, and with that gorgeous red bark, I think many other people. But you can make up any variety of chaparral plants you want. And you can choose a particular part of your yard and make up the hills of Mount Diablo and another to simulate coastal scrub. It's really up to you. Or you could specifically look for the local natives and showcase your local flora. Now, Al's yard has plants from all over California, but I have to tell you that if you were able to shut off all the land, the lawn mowers and backpack blowers and passing car noises from his neighborhood, you would think that you were in the woods. The Stellar's, Joy, Stellar's Jays, Oak Tip Mice, California Quail, California Tohees that all come into his yard, the hummingbirds that wouldn't stop calling, it's just amazing. And uh, Al is in his 80s and it takes a lot of effort to host a garden tour. During the last Bringing Back the Natives Garden Tour on Zoom, Al took people around his yard by video. 
Um, Al looks at his yard with a critical eye during blooming season. He looks to see what is missing. Is there a color that would be uh, complementing this picture? Should I put in more reds, more whites? And he pays close attention to when he expects blooms for each part, each plant, so that he can place new plants that will fill in those spaces that have too many plants that don't bloom during any particular period. Um, Al's garden has had an effect in the neighborhood. Other neighbors uh, have clearly taken his cue and installed native plants in their yards. There are many different colors of buckwheat from pink to yellow to white and more, and the bees love them. When these buckwheats are in bloom, they're covered in native bees and of course honeybees looking for an easy meal. And Al has several different currants in his yard, including several chaparral currants. Now, I found that golden currant is native to my yard in Manteca and late last year found that the leaves were full of holes and dozens of chrysalises were plastered all over the stems. I had no idea that my plant had contributed so much to the Lepidopteran population, which should tell you that concerns about insects eating your plants might be overblown. I felt uh, very fortunate to be able to interview Al and document the yard like I did. Now, Al's garden is an example of plant community landscaping because the, he planted his garden after natural areas he had visited. He knew what kind of plants to try and find. And remember, he was doing this in the 1970s. Life is much easier on a native plant gardener these days. Some of you have already, uh, some of you already live in the redwoods. The redwoods already have a palette of native plants that go really well in that community. As dominant as redwoods are, they are only one plant in a redwood plant community. And the Northern Coastal Scrub is another plant community. You may not even know that your neighborhood used to be in that community before it was developed because all the native plants are gone. They are tools like, there are tools like Calflora to find the information on what your native, your neighborhood plant community used to look like. So that the local pollinators starving for native plants can suddenly find somewhere in your yard to live again. I know that this chaparral plant community that you see in this picture um, as I traveled over Mount Hamilton, it looks very homogenous plant, as a plant community, but it is not. It is not, it is not. When you recreate a habitat, you get to choose what goes into it. You can have lots of variety. Now, um, I love monarchs, but they are a shiny thing, just like bluebirds. When you hear about planting milkweed for them, you may have noticed that no one ever mentions the other butterflies, at least very rarely. And according to the Zierster Society, as bad off as monarchs are, there are other local butterflies that are in worse trouble. Of course, that doesn't mean that I want you to stop planting milkweed, but I am going to provide some tools that will let you know how to help other butterflies and moths, and I hope you use them. I'm about to show you how you can find out what butterflies are native to your area. And by the way, this is not the demonstration I promised earlier. This is the list of butterflies and moths for Santa Clara County. I guarantee you the San Mateo County has a list of butterflies and I know uh, for a fact that many of them are in desperate need of help. Here is the top, uh, just the top of the page for San Mateo County. All of these butterflies can be found in the city of San Mateo. Now, um, what do they do for food? And of, of course, like I said, you put in the city of Pacifica, you put in your address. So we can look and see what's native to your specific address. Um, and you can find what's, what butterflies you should be seeing flying through your yard. Um, so, uh, what, like I said, what do they do for food? What, what do these butterflies all do for food? So you click on the butterfly, um, buckeye butterfly, and you find more information on its, uh, here's its range, here's the, the different host plants, and uh, then uh, you click on the host plant and you get more information on that particular plant. As you can see, Calscape is a tremendous tool. This should be the first place you go to learn about the historic natives of our town. Please do give it a look. But when you look at each of these butterfly host plants, I want to, you to ask yourself, where 
the butterflies would find them near you. I can assure you that the different mimulus plants Al has around his yards, he's got red ones and orange ones and all different colors. Um, they're, they're beautiful. And the same goes for the lupins and the sages and the manzanitas and the cyanothuses and the California fuchsias and all of the other native plants that we ignore so we can plant something from Indonesia in our yard. So uh, I've stayed up to date on the happenings around the habitat thanks to this page, Facebook page for the, the California Blueberry Recovery Program. And around California, uh, and a story was posted regarding the Kino checker spot butterfly around the time I was giving my original talk to this garden club in Los Altos Hills. We cover all of California. So we posted the plan to help save this endangered butterfly in San Diego, the Kino checker spot butterfly. It's a species of the Evis checker spot butterfly. And when you look at CalScape for information, that's what they give you information on is the Evis checker spot butterfly as a species without going into subspecies. Well, it turns out the San Diego butterfly is in trouble. And butterfly habitat is native habitat, native plants. When I look at it that way, it is easy to understand why our butterflies are in such bad shape. And I got to thinking to myself, I wonder what other but local butterflies need our help. And lo and behold, I came across the bay checker spot butterfly. The bay checker spot is also a subspecies of the Edith checker spot and is likely suffering from the same issues. So thanks to a biologist named Paul Ehrlich, the bay checker spot is still around. I have heard of this butterfly before. And based upon what I've read, this is a well-studied butterfly. Unfortunately, I didn't see anything suggesting that its range is expanding back to what it once was. So I did some research and I found this Friends of Edgewood Park article on the bait checker spot and its problems. So uh, let me read a bit from this Edgewood article. What could, we what could have caused this population crash? Scientists point to a likely cause, urban smog and automobile, automobile emissions. Each day, more than 100,000 vehicles spe uh, speed past Edgewood on Highway 280, spewing nitrogen, oxides, and ammonia, both potent slow-release fertilizers. This air pollution fertilizer is enriching our nitrogen-poor serpentine soils, allowing non-native annual grasses to crowd out the native plants. The California plantain, Planto, a Plantago erecta is a native annual and is an important host plant for the uh, checker spots. By 2002, non-native Italian ryegrass uh, had overtaken much of the butterfly's favorite habitat and choked out the California plantain that they needed to survive. So here's a government article about the habitat, the, the butterfly seed that I, let's see. That's principal. Okay, I'm missing a slide. Um, the uh, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, that was that's actually the article I just read. Um, here's the government article actually about the butterfly getting its own preserve. This has great. This was great news, but it gets tempered when later on when they actually reduce the size of the preserve, and I'll talk about that. Here is the center of biological. Uh, Center for Biological Diversity article that I'd also like to read from. Luckily for the bay checker spot butterfly, its population plunge was observed early by biologists, earning it a Federal Endangered Species Act listing in 1987. But the sensitive butterfly and its native host plants are no match for human development and non-native plant invasions. Since U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service failed to designate a critical habitat for the species after its listing, the, cre the center filed suit and ultimately won the 23,000 acres of habitat protection for the butterfly. Unfortunately, the agency slashed that protected habitat by 23% in August 28, uh, 2008, ignoring the conclusions of its own eight federal recovery plan, uh, as well as the threat of climate change, which reduces the food availability 
uh, for the butterfly's larvae. Like all butterflies, the bait checker spot is extremely vulnerable to pesticides, which contaminate its host plants and poison its larvae to protect species from toxic chemicals. The center is challenging the environmental protection agencies uh, registration and authorization for use for, of 46 uh, pesticides in and upstream of habitats for San Francisco Bay Area uh, endangered species, including the Bay Checker Spot. We've also released a comprehensive report poisoning our imperiled wildlife, detailing the risks um, posed by pesticides to Checker Spot and other endangered wildlife in the Bay Area. And we continue to monitor and oppose harmful chemical pesticides used in California throughout the um, through our pesticides reduction campaign. So what we know, the primary host is the endangered dwarf California plantain. Secondary host is purple owl's clover or exerted Indian paintbrush. And primary habitat native grassland located on large serpentine rock outcome croppings. Secondary habitat is islands in such grasslands on smaller outcrops. And tertiary ha habitat is non-serpentine soils with similarities uh, to serpentine soils. So the butterfly has 17,000 acres of refuge, but is not expanding fast at all. And need for uh, the need for pesticide-free suitable habitat uh, kept free of invasive weed uh, gr weedy grasses and dis restored habitats should be native grasses with at least um, plantain and if possible the secondary host plant. So here is the calscape information on this plantain. Though we know that this plant really should have uh, have serpentine soils, calscape doesn't say that that is necessary and we may not be able to set up better habitat than tertiary habitat, but that would still be better than nothing. And here is the information on the Densiflower uh, Indian paintbrush, the secondary uh, have, uh, secondary host plant. I know that I'm flying through this, but I will provide links um, to all these sites very soon and the resources guide to go along with this recorded version of this talk. Here is a range map with the areas that the bait checker spot has been extirpated. It is now only found in Southern San Jose towards Gilroy and a special population I'll talk about. This is a very bad news, but on the other hand, oddly enough, I'm talking to an audience that might be able to do something about this. And here is where it is. Note that th this is all based on that, that map, the extirpation map I showed. Um, Note that the population is shown up at Edgewood Park. This is a population that had disappeared but was reintroduced by Edgewood volunteers. They recreated the habitat in Edgewood and translocated caterpillars from the original preserve. So where can this butterfly go? Just as the butterfly on the original preserve is stuck on that preserve, those butterflies on Edgewood are going to try and repopulate surrounding neighborhoods and beyond, but can they? This butterfly can only reproduce in suitable habitat. Habitat being defined as a place with a food, water, shelter, and space and conditions for reproduction that, organ that the organism needs. We know of just a couple of plants that it can feed on. So where will they go? Now, I decided to look and see how far the bay checker spot can migrate and oh my god I found it. They did say this butterfly had been studied and apparently they were right. The study says that they will travel 4.7 miles to find new habitat. But again, where do they go? So if I'm being optimistic, I could say that the population could spread out, but it would take effort on our part. The population used to go all the way to San Francisco just a few decades ago. And now it's stuck on a preserve in San Jose and thankfully with the good people of Edgewood. Now there is the pos positive that there is not, they're not gonna blink out. And frankly, we, we need to help this butterfly. With the effort, we could actually help the bait checker spot butterfly to spread, but it would take planting plants. 
That's right. It would take planting the right plants. Is that an impossible task? I think not. I deliberately read the challenges this uh, butterfly has faced so that you will understand that I'm probably oversimplifying this, but habitat restoration is the only hope this butterfly has of ever reclaiming its former range. And I'm telling you, we could do this if we try. Here is how we, how we do it. Now, I'm talking to a crowd from San Mateo, and this presentation was originally written for a Santa Clara County group. I worked in Santa Clara uh, County. I'm uh, the Santa Clara County Bluebird Nest Bus Coordinator. So that's why I made the, the map for Santa Clara County. And I want you to, to take what I say about how uh, we can help the Coyote Valley butterflies and apply it to Edgewood and San Bruno Mountain and in all the other places in San Mateo County that has endangered butterflies because frankly, butterflies in the Bay Area are not doing well and we need, they need our help, whether we help them at a local park or in our backyard. Now, remember, let's see, remember this slide. This is the map of Bay Area with the little icons to mark sightings and is essentially a record of when each area was extirpated, when the last sightings occurred. The green are the current population. And, and even this is, you know, uh, an older map. But the taking that, I applied it to the map. So this is just a, a Google map that I took. Near as I can figure, when I compared that other map I just showed you, to the Google map, I believe that this is where the, the, the most Northern sighting was taking place. Um, and I've done a lot of work, um, this work without actually talking to anybody who knows, what the, knows anything about this. Someday I'll find out that I'm doing this all wrong and I apologize, um, but hopefully you understand the concept. The first thing to do is to build a population where it is, establish it in place. So if it's, already visiting this area down here by Coyote Creek, then that's the place to start planting uh, plantain. That means plantain of the correct variety and the other suitable plants need to be planted starting in the area where the butterfly is and then build those numbers. And the next group of butterflies will fly out to fly, find new digs. When, once, they've, once they've grown too many caterpillars there, they're gonna wanna distribute out further out. So we give them new digs and we make sure that it is well within 4.7 miles and hopefully even closer. So what do we do? What we do is to go knocking on doors and ask if we can plant a bay checker spot butterfly garden. We want to do this. We want the first ones in the area considered home range first. So we started Hellier Park, Los Lagos, or at least along Coyote Creek. Then we start putting in hopeful future sites like Lake Cunningham Park, Cruz Park, and Kelly Park for them to spread into. Those will need to be at least moderately sized uh, plant, um, patches of plants. So they, can be, uh, they can't be missed from the air, but not so large that they draw in huge crowds of predators. Um, and this, and let's see, this population, this butterfly doesn't migrate. So if we can build up the numbers in an area they already inhabit, we can get them to the point where they will sp start spreading from there. And remember that this is a Santa Clara County strategy, but there are San Bruno and South, San South City and Burlingame. There are other butterflies and you can try and help the San Bruno mountain butterflies um, as well. And those um, of you outside Edgewood can help with the butterflies in Edgewood to find places, new places where they can go. So we could use smaller patches in local backyards. Unfortunately, we don't know if the Coyote Creek sighting was a butterfly futilely looking for a patch uh, of host plants. Perhaps we can start having people watch for this butterfly as a way to know where they actually are and where they're looking, where they are looking. Uh, Bay natives in San Francisco is said to have the plantain along with East Bay Wilds in Oakland, two seed companies as well. Frankly, this sounds like a job for seeds, but it will also require love. If pesticides are a problem, and they are, 
we need to have this little refuge to be a pesticide-free zone. That doesn't happen without work. We need regular weed pulling. This butterfly needs love. And you might be thinking to yourself, will the parks department really want to help us? Would they really let us do this? Yes, doing this is the right way. They absolutely will. It is great PR. Just as Edgewood did it, other communities nearby can step up and put a patch in their neighborhood park. It would look great in the papers. You can pick up more volunteers, uh, you can put more volunteers as long as it has a core of people willing to spearhead it. Uh, remember the La Loma Native Garden. This butterfly does have a refuge, but it will never get off that refuge if we don't do this. It could fly forever and never find any more of its host plants. If you live in the zone where this butterfly is fairly close, I think you can, I hope you think about this. Dense flower Indian paintbrush has no availability according to uh, Calscape. But um, we could maybe talk to the California Native Plant Society to find where this, this uh, plant is and start propagating it. Um, and then we rem remember that this isn't just about the bay checker spot. This is about butterflies and moths in general. This is, uh, oh, let's see. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's about other uh, in general. So every one of those lepidopterans needs to, a place to lay their eggs. Now this is the uh, San Bruno elfin butterfly. And uh, there are people who are trying to help this butterfly. Should we leave it to them? Or can we help it also? Um, sedum is its host plant. And then there are more. This one's the uh, Calepi uh, silver spot butterfly. This is information I just found right on the web, right? It, they talk about the host plants. They talk about where this butterfly is. They're talking about trying to set up um, more refuges, but you know what? Uh, these butterflies could simply use a refuge right in your yard or in your nearby park. Um, and uh, so it doesn't end there. There are dozens of butterflies and moths that need space in our gardens, in our parks, in our schoolyards, in our corporate campuses. Why not? On neglected strips of land in our neighborhood that are currently covered in gravel and ivy. So about this time, you might be thinking that I'm nuts. You might be thinking that we can't bring back a species from the brink. Well, that's not true. You may have heard about the silver digger bee in San Francisco. They were doing some habitat restoration. They came back to find a species of bee, native bee, that they hadn't seen in years, hovering all over their new plantings. It can be done. And also in San Francisco, Tim Wong, an a, aquatic biologist at Cal, uh, California Academy of Science, is known for planting habitat for the pipevine swallowtail in his backyard. And he even reintroduced the species to San Francisco. And I told you about that Doug Ptolemy talk um, he gave to the LA chapter of the California Native Plant Society in 2018. Boy, I hope you watch that talk. Um, it's on YouTube. And I have to tell you that the final story I'm not going to spoil it uh, more than I have to, but um, it is a, he's a far better storyteller than I am. But the gist of the Atala butter is that the, the Atala butterfly was considered extinct. They wanted to list it as endangered, but they couldn't find them anywhere. So the Atala was considered extinct. It depended on a plant that was decimated years ago by greedy, thoughtless people who destroyed the host plant. But after it was first declared extinct, the host plant was reintroduced as a landscape plant, just completely out of the blue. People realized that the host plant was actually a really cool plant. So they started planting it around and a small remnant population of Atala somewhere apparently found the new plantings and spread. The species was saved by accident. So the, um, I, I wanna thank you. Um, I don't know if you can still see me, but, uh, there are three, Tub Ptolemy has three different books, um, Bring Nature Home, Nature's Best Hope, and his latest one, The Nature of Oaks. I really hope they're, they're available on audio, audio books. If you don't like reading, you can get it and listen to it in the car while you're driving. But well, they are so good. Um, so I, um, I really hope that you're able to do something for them. 
Um, and let me uh, let me see if uh, let's see. There's uh, ten thousand square feet. Um, it's square at Crystal Springs in the city is considering changing from ivy. Um, yeah, to the native plants. I highly recommend that you look at that area and see if there are butterflies that could be helped um, with a butterfly garden as part of that project. Um, wow, um, that would be great. Ed, Ed, oh, that would be, all right, that's responding to that. Mike, I hope you will discuss changing, updating a garden to a native plant natural habitat. Um, well, I'm not sure what, what it is. I'm not sure quite what it is uh, you were hoping for, but let, you can let me know. Um, SMAS has plantains for sale. Excellent. Okay, good deal. So um, what I want to do is I want to stop sharing this. And uh, I want to share, uh, yes, this. Uh, all right. This is Calscape, okay? So let's go ahead and look at what we have near the Central Park in San Mateo, I think it was. Okay, these are all of the, so this, you can put your address in here. It'll tell you what's native to your neighborhood. And uh, everybody can see this, I hope. Um, so according to this, near this area, there are 29 species of trees 94 shrubs, there's perennials, annuals, grasses, uh, succulents and vines, ferns. And then what happens after this is this is what native plants can I put in the sun? What native plants can I put in the shade? What native plants can I put in partial shade? Ground covers, butterfly host plants, hedges, bank stabilization, low water, very low water, damp soils, and the very easy, it, it's all, it's so good. Now let's look at, uh, let's look at uh, annuals. And you can see this, all these beautiful annual plants, right? Let's look at sky lupin. And you will find uh, not just one, but several photos that show how beautiful this plant is. You see over here, that's the range of sky lupin. So some of these plants have a very, very small range um, and others are literally all over California. Many of them are everywhere, but in the central California, central Valley. Um, so, but you can find like all these different plants that are around here. Then you look further down here. Now what this is, 12 nurseries to carry this plant. You can find out where this plant is found. Right, you you look in here and it tells you all the different places. Um, and some of these, like Larner seeds, I mentioned them in Bellinas, uh, Pacific Coast seed, SNS seed, seed hunt, Stover seed. Um, so you can find, you can get these. And a lot of these plants are are, are just as easy. They're, they're they might even be easier to plant by um, by seed. You know, I actually found a plant and uh, I got the seeds. I knew that they were native. And um, I went up to uh, uh, Boggs Track Community Farm in, um, in uh, Stockton. Uh, they're a great farm and they were, they were letting me plant some plants up there. I put down, uh, I thought, you know, the, I didn't think that much of, the, of, of how, how attractive this particular plant was. So I just dropped the whole packet of seeds right there. And I came back like in the spring and I'm looking down and there's all these plants there. I'm like, what are those? And there are bees all over it. Little tiny bees, little native bees. And they're just, I actually got it on video. They're, they're all over this plant. And it dawned on me that I was responsible for doing that by simply taking a packet of seeds and spreading it all over the ground. They came up with the winter rains. It, it was so easy. Um, so you, you can find out what, um, where to get any of these plants, right? And then you come down here. Um, so it gives you a little synopsis, talks about it, um, talks about um, sky lupin. It talks about the plant type, size, form, growth rate, dormancy, fragrance, flower color, and flowering season. Um, so you can actually, you can actually plan 
on which plants will bloom in throughout the season by going and looking at this. It talks about which uh, butterflies and moths host off of this plant. And all of these, now you're gonna find this is a lupin. So all of these are probably gonna like lupins. So bush lupins, um, which are, are shrubs, or um, they're, they'll also go off of annual lupins. Um, and then there are, of course, perennial lupins. It also talks about full uh, sun, when there's full sun shade, um, moisture, what, how, you know, does it, is it drought tolerant? Um, it actually talks about how to summer irrigate. Um, ease of care, um, is it easy? Is it hard? Um, what kind of cold tolerance they have? Soil drainage, soil description, common uses. Companion plants, which is wonderful because remember I talked about plant communities. This helps you figure out, you know, what other plants will work really well with this for water, um, water compatibility um, and stuff like that, how to propagate it, site type, climate. Um, not all of these uh, are, um, not all of these are, are gonna be available. Sometimes you look at this and it says, um, nurseries that carry the plant is zero. And, and that's sad, but, um, but the, the, the big thing is if you go for the ones that are out there, that's better than nothing. And it may be up to the Native Plant Society to go out and find those other ones and try and get other native plants so that we can, we can um, plant some of the ones that simply aren't found anywhere. And sometimes you'll find those at the California Native Plant Society nurseries. Um, but the California Native Plant Society nurseries are also shown on, the, um, on these nurseries here. Um, so then you go down here, like the Painted Lady. Remember I said I have that in my yard. Um, and it shows you the range for the Painted Lady. Now, um, the Painted Lady has a lot of different host plants. It actually talks about the host plants here. Um, well, it's not there, but it, it, it normally does. Let's see if I do. Um, there's a gray hair streak. So the gray hair streak also likes that lupin. But you notice it has a different, uh, a different range map here. Um, the, the range is different. So the gray hair streak is also another lupin plant lever. And uh, it, um, but because it, and the, the funny thing is the lupin actually has a different range. So the lupin and the butterfly have two different ranges, even though the lupin uses that as a, as a, um, as a host plant. So the reason for that is because uh, you have to really look at that. You can't just say, well, this particular butterfly is gonna use this plant in my yard if the, if the butterfly isn't in your yard. So that's why you can use the range map of both the butterfly and the, um, and the plants to figure out what is going to be in your yard, okay? So um, I, the, if you look up along the top here, you can learn specifically about the butterflies that are in your yard. If you look at uh, the, this talk, you can look up here at nurseries. You can learn about all of the different nurseries in California um, and and stuff. So anyway, that is Calscape. I hope that. Uh, you are able to um, to do something with that. Um, uh, if I, I, I assume nobody has, else has any other questions, but um, anyway, that's my talk. Wow, thank you, Mike. That was an excellent presentation. So much great information on how we can incorporate native plants into our gardens. Thank you very much. Yeah, I hope everyone has learned how to, we can encourage birds, bees, and butterflies, and other wildlife into our gardens. I'm definitely going to refer to Calscape and other, you, other resources that you've mentioned. Excellent. Well, thank you. Hey, right. In a few days, you will be emailed a link to a recording of the presentation and evaluation form. Any unanswered questions can be addressed at that time. We would appreciate feedback on what worked and where we can improve. Please join us for future seminars and workshops. Uh, the free seminar on Sunday, April 3rd will be Edible Container Gardening with Laurel Nagel, who is a professional gardener, master gardener, and has a landscape architecture degree with UC Berkeley Extension. And she is the owner of Every Bloomin' Thing, a container gardening service. 
sign up for the Zoom program on our website, sanmateoarboretum.org slash classes dash events. And the Master Gardeners have returned for their monthly plant clinics. Come anytime between 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Sunday, April 3rd. They will be available to answer your questions from general information to advice about specific problems. On Saturday, March 12th from 10 a.m. to noon, uh, come and help beautify Central Park's Rose Garden. Rose Garden volunteers are asking for help applying compost and mulch to the beds. Bring gloves and dress in layers. Meet at the gazebo in San Mateo Central Park. You can join the Arboretum Society and receive a discount on workshops at a variety of nurseries and businesses on the peninsula and get a 10% discount on all purchase at the Arboretum Society's nursery. Also, let us know if you're interested in volunteering by signing up on our website or e emailing us at info at San Mateo or calling at calling 650-579-0536. We have a variety of opportunities from working in the nursery to maintenance, organizing monthly seminars and workshops and community outreach. Thank you again to Mike and to Kevin, our Zoom technical specialist, and to all of you for joining us today. The program is now finished.